The Master and Margarita by Mikhail Bulgakov is a beautiful, magical, fantastical and profound masterpiece of Russian literature and one of the greatest novels of the 20th century. This dark, satirical comedy about what happens when the devil comes to the atheistic Moscow of the 1930s is a sumptuous feast of rich ideas and colourful images, and the novel explores the absurdity of the Soviet Union. It explores what it's like living under tyrannical rule and gripped by the fever of mass hysteria in a way that continues to be powerfully relevant today. This work, which defies simple generic designations and which was Bulgakov's offering of a kind of fifth gospel, the gospel of Satan. This work explores the ambiguity of good and evil, their relationship with one another, and how you cannot have light without darkness. This work explores the importance of courage and the abhorrent nature of cowardice, and Bulgakov is keen to contrast authentic art which speaks the truth and speaks truth to power with the bureaucratized, censored and tightly controlled fake art of those who pander to the repressive regime. And ultimately, I see this as a story about the power of love. And I see this as a deeply moving and romantic novel, romantic in every sense of the word. And because we are now kicking off a deep reading and lecture series of Bulgakov's masterpiece at the Hardcore Literature Book Club at patreon.com forward slash hardcore literature, today I would like to talk to you about how to approach this life-changing work in a way that will be intellectually, spiritually, emotionally and artistically rewarding. We're going to talk about Soviet realism, life in Stalin's oppressive Soviet Union. We're going to talk about defamiliarization, the gospel of Satan, censorship and much more. I am so grateful that we can read The Master and Margarita today, but it gives me chills to contemplate the fact that we very nearly didn't have this novel at all. Bulgakov wrote the manuscript in secret, and he would memorise the entire thing, as many writers in the Soviet Union did at the time. They would memorise their works and store it up inside of them, just in case the secret police came knocking and confiscated it. But ultimately, the novel wouldn't be published until two and a half decades after Bulgakov's death. He wrote the novel from 1928 through to the year of his death in 1940, but a censored version with chapters cut out would only be published in Moscow magazine, thanks to Bulgakov's widow, Elena, in 1966. Then, what is known as a Samizdat version, an underground version, began to circulate with those censored parts, with those cut chapters put back in. And luckily, a manuscript was smuggled out of the Soviet Union. It was smuggled to Paris, where YMCA Press, who were renowned for having published the banned works of Alexander Solzhenitsyn, published it in 1967, and it was published in English around the same time, and The Master and Margarita took the literary world by storm. But it wouldn't be until 1973 that the complete version was actually published in Russian. The Master and Margarita simply could not have been published during Stalin's lifetime. And when it was published, it was the first work in the Soviet Union to explore religion and the devil. Manuscripts don't burn. You may be familiar with this phrase. This is the most famous line from this novel, and this is something that the devil says to the master of the title, the writer character who puts his heart and soul into his work 
and then consigns it to the flames. Manuscripts don't burn. What this means is you cannot destroy an idea. You cannot kill art. Art will survive. Great ideas that speak to the human condition will endure, no matter how oppressive the regime one is writing in. And art that speaks truth to power will prosper and flourish and will root itself into the souls of those who experience it. Now, of course, oppressive, tyrannical regimes always try to control art. They ban books and they burn books because they know how powerful art is. And of course, in the words of Heinrich Heine, where they burn books, they will also ultimately burn people. You can't just ban and burn a book because when you do so, you are attempting to ban and burn the human soul. But one of the reasons why this line, manuscripts don't burn, carries so much resonance, so much weight and truth, is because Bulgakov himself cast his manuscript into the fireplace. The year is 1930, and everything was going wrong in the writer's life, and had been going wrong for quite some time. By this point in his life, Bulgakov had had enough, and not only did he burn several of his manuscripts, but he was also going to put a stop to his life. He actually put his gun to his temple and had his finger on the trigger and was about to pull it when all of a sudden the phone rang and the person on the other end was none other than the man whose rule had led to so much suffering in the great writer's life. It was the general secretary of the Soviet Union Joseph Stalin. And without this phone call, we wouldn't have the Master and Margarita, and that would have been the end of Bulgakov's life. Now, before we get into the details of that phone call, we need to paint a picture of Soviet life under Stalin and what Bulgakov had to contend with. Because the Master and Margarita is a satirical and an allegorical work. And at the Hardcore Literature Book Club, we have been getting acquainted with allegories and the power of allegorical writing. At time of recording, we have just wrapped up a deep reading of John Steinbeck's East of Eden, and later this year we are going to read Dante's Inferno together. So we're really familiarising ourselves with allegory. And allegories are, quite simply, when one thing stands in for another. There is a hidden meaning in the work, and you need to interpret it to reveal the hidden meaning. And the hidden meaning is typically political or moral. So an allegorical work is symbolic, it's representative, and it has a lot of metaphorical power. And as Aristotle taught us, thinking in metaphor is the highest form of cognition. And this means that allegorical works pose an extraordinary amount of difficulty, but their rewards are in proportion to the difficulty. The difficulty is you need to know what the work is an allegory of. So if it's a religious allegory, then you need some familiarity with the religious stories. If it's a political allegory, then you need to acquaint yourself with the geopolitical, historical and cultural context of that which is being repackaged up and commented upon. And the same is very much true with satire. And Bulgakov is very much a satirist of the highest order. And you cannot appreciate satire if you don't know what is being satirised. And this has led to quite a divergence in reading experiences when it comes to the Russian-speaking side of the world and the rest of the world. Those who have lived through the Soviet Union or have family members who lived under the Soviet Union will find this book to be incredibly funny. Those who didn't, however, might find themselves a little bit bemused, and they might see the Master and Margarita primarily as something of a fantastical drug trip in literary form, a carnival-esque and Kafka-esque kaleidoscope of hallucinatory imagery. And when I see readers finding this book 
difficult, they typically follow on by saying it's difficult because they don't quite know the history. They don't know what is being represented and commented upon. So that is key. You absolutely need to learn about Soviet history in order to appreciate the Master and Margarita. Bulgakov wrote this book in the Soviet Union between 1928 and 1940. So that means when he started, Lenin had been dead for a good few years and Stalin is holding power. And our educational system does not teach us enough about Stalin in the West, doesn't teach us about the Soviet Union. The focus in history lessons is almost exclusively on Hitler and Nazi Germany. But the Soviet Union, you need to learn about the history of the Soviet Union. Stalin was one of the most bloodthirsty dictators of all time. And the death toll, not including war, the death toll in the country from his tyrannical actions is up there in the tens of millions. If you were living in the Soviet Union around the time that Bulgakov was writing, then you had seen untold amounts of turmoil. You had seen civil war, you had seen revolution, and you had seen mass violence and death. Bulgakov was in his late 20s during the Bolshevik Revolution, which saw Russia abolish its monarchy and institute a socialist government. Contemporary to this, Russia was also suffering from the fallout of the First World War. And Bulgakov, who was born in Kiev, he was born in Ukraine in 1891, was trained as a doctor, and he would see to the wounded during the war. Like Chekhov before him, medicine was Bulgakov's original area of expertise. Bulgakov would be revulsed by the mob mentality of the Bolsheviks, and he was decidedly against the revolution. And not only did he find the mob violence to be abhorrent, but he also found those who saw it and said nothing about it to be just as bad. And in The Master and Margarita, we get this idea from Bulgakov's Christ, because Christ is a character, he's referred to as Yeshua rather than Jesus, that's the Aramaic form of his name. Bulgakov's Christ says that cowardice is the worst vice. Bulgakov was a rather sensitive and compassionate soul, and that ended up wounding him very deeply inside. Seeing the bloodshed and the violence really upset him. Towards the end of the First World War, Bulgakov was posted to Smolensk to serve as the provincial physician. And this was a very difficult time in Bulgakov's life, the citizens were absolutely desperate for medical care, and he ended up seeing a hundred patients a day, all of them suffering from severe sickness and injury. And all of this took a very strong toll on the writer, who ended up turning to morphine for relief. He ended up developing a strong morphine addiction. Of course, at this time, morphine was something that was prescribed when you sawed someone's leg off. If someone needed to have a limb amputated, then they would take morphine. It was very heavy duty. But Bulgakov was trying to fix a spiritual problem. He was trying to sort out his deep inner turmoil pharmaceutically with a very powerful drug. And this caused no end of problems for Bulgakov and his wife as he was doped up just to get through his day. And indeed, she fell pregnant, and Bulgakov was so terrified of what kind of child a morphine addict could have, and they decided to abort it. All of this caused Bulgakov intense inner turmoil, and he would be haunted by how he treated his wife for the rest of his life. Now, although Bulgakov was fascinated with religion and the Christian tradition, he was fascinated not in terms of dogmatic prescription, but in terms of the power of having a shared European cultural heritage. And in the atheistic Soviet Union, he saw the loss of religion as a loss of culture and art. And although his father had been very orthodox, for many years Bulgakov turned away from religious faith and embraced non-belief. But he also, over the course of his life, saw visions of the devil. And this started in childhood, but it got worse and worse. The more the country fell apart around him, the more violence he saw, 
the more distress in his personal day-to-day -day life he had to endure, the more he started to see these visions of the devil. And we see that his experiences as a doctor inspired him to turn to writing, and he began to pen his experiences and put them together in this book, A Country Doctor's Notebook. And there's a great television adaptation of this starring John Hamm and Daniel Radcliffe, which I highly recommend. And being a writer, that seems to be more in accord with who Bulgakov really was. Indeed, as a young boy growing up in Kiev, his loves were literary and musical. He devoured not only the Russian classics from Pushkin, Chekhov, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, Gogol, and so on, but he fell in love with Western writers too, writers like Dickens, Hugo, Cervantes, Ibsen, Maupassant, and Oscar Wilde. And he would go to the opera endlessly. Indeed, when an opera production of Faust, a production based on Goethe's drama, came to the theatre, young Mikhail saw it 41 times. And Bulgakov himself had a rich baritone voice, and he came from a very musical family, and had once yearned to be an opera singer himself. Opera, theatre, literature, all of these were strong loves for Bulgakov. And he would even learn operas like Faust, Carmen, Tannhäuser, by heart. So it made sense that his pen would increasingly find its way to paper, and it is a tragedy that his paper would then curl up in flames. But he wasn't the one to decide to destroy his work. Oh, that was something that the petty, censor-happy bureaucrats and socialist literary critics that ran the theatre and literary circles were already obsessed with doing. So, what was the Soviet literary scene like? whilst Bulgakov was writing. Well, if you crack The Master and Margarita open, you will immediately meet two characters, and their conversation will give you a good sense of the climate, the cultural climate at the time. We have a man called Berlioz, Mikhail Alexandrovich Berlioz, who is a literary journal editor, and he is chairman of the board for Masalit. And this character is actually based on Bulgakov's own editor, a man who rejected his works based on his exploration of religion. We see at the beginning of The Master and Margarita that Berlioz is talking with a poet called Ivan, and he writes under the pen name of Homeless. In Russian, it's Bezdomny. And Berlioz is from Masalit. Masalit is Bulgakov's satirical lampooning of the Soviet literary associations. And in the late 1920s, you had multiple writers' groups which were vying for control over the cultural landscape, and the atmosphere was incredibly claustrophobic and oppressive. Then, in the early 1930s, these literary organisations were amalgamated into one organisation under the government's control. And this was called the Soviet Writers' Union. And you basically had to be a member of the union in order to be a writer. You had your little identification card, your official documentation, to prove that you were a part of the union, you were a writer. And there's a great lampooning of this absurdity in The Master and Margarita, where members of the Devil's Retinue say, a writer is defined not by any identity card, but by what he writes. To convince yourself that Dostoevsky was a writer, do you have to ask for his identification card? Just take any five pages from any one of his novels, and you'll be convinced, without any identification card, that you are dealing with a writer. Now, one of the main purposes of the Soviet Writers' Union was to foster a new path in literature called socialist realism. And they made socialist realism the official method of literature in the USSR. They mandated that artists, writers, and painters depicted 
an idealised representation of life under socialism. And so artistic works needed to show society in its progressive development towards the socialist dream and needed to basically depict workers under the care of their leaders marching into the bright future of communism. What we see in The Master and Margarita is Bulgakov making fun of these approved methods of art, methods of writing, and it really is fascinating to research and look into Soviet art because you can see that it is all propaganda. But the really fascinating thing is every so often you'll see a piece of art, if we're talking about a painting, a mural for example, we'll see a piece of art that clearly shows the artist to be an absolute master of their craft. We see propaganda vying with art and artistic expression for supremacy. It's a shame, really, if you think about it, that there were so many great artists, so many great writers who had an artistic and creative genius that was being suppressed at the time, and so they needed to kind of battle with the rules for what they could get away with, what they could push up against. But overwhelmingly, for the most part, written works, works of literature that were crafted in this vein had very literal meanings. There was rarely complex or nuanced meaning for that you had to go underground. Socialist realist works needed to be about empowering the proletariat. And there was intense censorship in the theatre world too, which was under political and bureaucratic control. Now at this time many writers wanted to identify their works as revolutionary, and that meant you involved the audience in the proletariat cause. But of course, it becomes swiftly apparent when you read The Master and Margarita that Bulgakov's novel was very far outside of the remit of this. He didn't want to write works according to the mandates, the dictates of socialist realism. But this would be a very difficult game to play, and you'd have to do it secretly if you wanted to get away with this. Anything that didn't serve the socialist aim was censored, and banned, and in many cases the state could deal with the issue of deviant writing by simply removing the writer. In the late 1930s the Soviet Union would see the Great Purge, also known as the Terror, in which Stalin systematically and ruthlessly arrested and killed his political enemies, which was a lot of people. No one was safe. But the thing is, people had been disappearing or vanishing for many years, and this would continue all the way through Stalin's reign right up until his death. Now, if you want to read a very harrowing description of what the climate of fear was like, then read Alexander Solzhenitsyn's The Gulag Archipelago. Solzhenitsyn ended up winning the Nobel Prize for his writings. Solzhenitsyn was arrested in 1945, and he was sent to a hard labour camp for writing comments about Stalin in a private letter. And if you read the Gulag Archipelago, this work does an absolutely tremendous job of conveying the atmosphere of the Soviet Union. Many at the time were familiar with the nighttime bang on the door, the sound of jackboots rushing up the stairs, and the soldiers filing in and whisking you away. The terrifying thing is that you couldn't trust anyone at this time. Your closest friends and family members, even, were liable to inform on you for anything, and it was common for people to simply disappear. The Gulag Archipelago is one of the most important books of the 20th century, so I highly recommend it. And you can contrast Solzhenitsyn's account with Bulgakov's. There's one passage very early on in The Master and Margarita where we learn about a mysterious apartment where multiple people, one after the other, just start vanishing. Inexplicable events began to occur in this apartment, Bulgakov writes. People began to disappear from this apartment without a trace. Once, on a day off, a policeman came to the apartment and called a lodger to the front hall and said he was invited to come to the police station for a minute to put his signature to something. And he left with the policeman, and he not only did not come back in ten minutes as promised, but never came back at all. The most surprising thing was 
that the policeman evidently vanished along with him. That's the absurd thing at the time. Soldier Nitsen himself was a high-ranking military official. This was a hysteria, this was a mob that feasted on itself. You would be perpetuating the atrocities, you'd be part of the problem one day, and then you would fall victim to it the next. Bulgakov himself knew many people who disappeared or vanished. The poet Ossip Mandelstam was disappeared. He was taken away along with his wife. She was also a writer and they were taken from the very same apartment building where Bulgakov was living and Ossip would die in a hard labour camp. In the words of his wife Nadizhda Mandelstam, it's only in our country that they respect poetry enough to kill people for it. Mandelstam was arrested for penning a poem that deliberately insulted Stalin. Now this was akin to expressing a death wish, really. He called the tyrant a peasant slayer. Now, when Bulgakov started to establish himself in the Moscow writing and theatre scene, and indeed primarily in the theatre scene because he was considered pretty much exclusively a playwright in his lifetime, he had authored 14 plays, stage adaptations, opera librettos, and so if you note a strong element of theatricality in his work, that's because the theatre was where he was most at home. We can notice such a thing with Shakespeare too. When Shakespeare writes poetry, we see the dramatist come through. Dickens is like this too. When Bulgakov started to establish himself, he very swiftly came to the attention of the authorities and was considered a subversive writer, and he was also considered the most dangerous writer in Moscow. After giving a reading of his The Heart of a Dog, one of the audience members reported him to the secret police, saying, the entire piece is written in tones which are hostile to the Soviet system and exude boundless contempt. The work was denounced, it was seized, and he wasn't allowed to publish it. The secret police interrogated Bulgakov and confiscated his papers, which included his private diaries. And then they suggested that Bulgakov simply stick to writing about the favoured topics, the topics that writers are typically concerned with, i.e. the approved topics, comrade. To which Bulgakov replied, I cannot write about peasant themes since I don't like the countryside. It's difficult for me to write about the everyday lives of workers, even though I know about that much more than peasant life, but even so, I don't know it very well. And indeed, I'm not very interested in it for the following reason. I am absorbed and keenly interested in the everyday life of the Russian intelligentsia, and I love it. I consider it to be an important component of our country, even if it is weak. Its fate is close to my heart, and its experiences are precious to me. That means I am only capable of writing about the life of the intelligentsia in the Soviet state. But I have a satirical mindset. Things come from my pen, which occasionally, as it seems, cause a sharp reaction in communist circles of society. I always write with a clear conscience, and I write as I see things. The negative aspects of life in the Soviet state attract my constant attention because I instinctively find a great deal of material there for myself. And he says, I am a satirist. So this is quite a bold thing to say to the secret police during interrogation. He is refusing to write about the approved topics and he's saying he wants to keep writing how he's writing. He wants to keep pointing out the negative parts of Soviet life because he's a satirist. Now, Bulgakov's first interrogation and the confiscating of his work took place the day before his theatre production of a play called The Days of the Turbines, which was based on his novel The White Guard. And for one one reason or another, Bulgakov seemed to get a pass. It was almost like his interrogation had been something of a test. It was a warning, yes, but it was a test too, and somehow he had managed to pass it. And not only that, but his play, The Days of the Turbines, was intensely favoured by Joseph Stalin himself, who would see it 15 times. And this helped to make the play a smash hit. It was always selling out and it was very difficult to get a ticket. Now, despite Stalin loving this play, yes, of course, the critics wouldn't dare say anything negative about this play. Despite Stalin loving this play, Bulgakov still had his works banned and censored, and he faced relentless scorn and abuse from the Soviet literary critical world. Bulgakov
Chekhov tried to keep going through all of this, and he ended up writing a play about one of his playwright heroes, Molière, the French dramatist. He would also write a biography of him. But after that, was banned as well. It all became too much for Bulgakov. He had four plays banned and very little recourse to keep himself afloat financially. He wanted to leave the Soviet Union, but he was denied. Out of desperation and having seen his friends disappear, get arrested and be silenced, he actually wrote a letter to Stalin himself in which he said, At the end of ten years my strength is broken, since I am no longer capable of surviving, since I am persecuted and since I know that I cannot be published or staged anymore within the confines of the USSR, and since I have been reduced to nervous exhaustion, I am turning to you and requesting your intercession before the government of the USSR to exile me beyond the borders together with my wife. This plea went unanswered, and despite the banning of his work, things started to look up for a little bit for Bulgakov because he would meet and fall in love with the woman who would be his third wife, Elena. And they were both married already, unhappily so, but whilst Elena's husband was away on business, she and Mikhail would spend as much time as possible together. She ended up inspiring him thoroughly, so thoroughly that she would resurface in his novel as the character Margarita. And their Romeo and Juliet love affair would steam off the pages. And indeed, apparently, one time at three in the morning, Bulgakov actually woke Elena up and took her to Patriarch Pons, which we see in the opening of this novel, and enigmatically he would say, this is where they first saw him. He's, of course, talking about the devil, who is Professor Voland in the book. He then took her to a strange apartment where two other men and himself entertained her. They fed her caviar and they proclaimed that Elena was a witch. Read this masterpiece and you'll see the life in the art. However, with the return of Elena's husband, the pair, deeply in love, ended up foregoing one another for almost two years, which plunged Bulgakov into a pit of depression. With his love gone and his works banned, everything seemed hopeless, and so Bulgakov threw his manuscript into the fire. Several manuscripts, in fact, and then, at his wit's end, he wrote another letter to Stalin. He complained that the Writers' Association overseeing the censorship and banning his works were destroying creative thought. They were strangling Soviet drama, and they will succeed in killing it off, he said. He wrote, to struggle against censorship of whatever kind and whatever the government in power is my duty as a writer, as are calls for freedom of the press. I am a passionate supporter of that freedom, and I consider that if any writer should think of trying to persuade me that he did not need it, then he would be like a fish declaring in public that it did not need water. He went on to say that the banning of his latest play about Moliere wasn't just a destruction of past works, but had now destroyed future ones too. And personally, he wrote, with my own hands, I threw into the stove the draft of a novel about the devil, the draft of a comedy, and the beginning of a second novel about the theatre. A couple of weeks later, Bulgakov's dear friend and literary rival, Vladimir Mayakovsky, committed suicide. He was mourned nationwide, and Bulgakov was present at his funeral as the coffin proceeded from the Writers' Club. And it was the very next day, clearly concerned that the nation's greatest artistic talents, the ones that weren't being arrested, exiled, or killed by the state, would increasingly start to kill themselves off. The very next day, the story goes, as Bulgakov was contemplating putting an end to his own life, putting an end to it all, just in the nick of time. Stalin called the writer. Do we call this divine intervention or devilish intervention? And the phone call went like this. We have received your letter, and we and the comrades had read it. You will receive a positive reply to it. But maybe it's true that you are really asking to go abroad. So, are you really that fed up with us? 
And of course, when the dictator of the country asks you if you're fed up with them, you don't say yes. Mikhail Bulgakov said, I've been thinking about that a great deal recently whether a Russian writer can live outside his homeland. And it seems to me that it would be impossible. You're right, Stalin said. I think that as well. So, where do you want to work? At the Moscow Arts Theatre? This was run by Konstantin Stanislavsky. So this was a good place to work if you were interested in the theatre. Yes, I do, Bulgakov said. But I've spoken to them about that and they turned me down. Well, Stalin said, you send in an application to them. I have a feeling that they will agree. We ought to meet and have a conversation. So Stalin, just in the nick of time, ends up getting Bulgakov work at the theatre, at Stanislavsky's theatre, and feeling a renewed sense of hope, Bulgakov started writing The Master and Margarita again, even drawing inspiration for Professor Voland from Joseph Stalin. But then, from here on out, Bulgakov would try many times to appeal to Stalin again, and he would never hear back from him. Letters went unanswered, and he had further appeals to leave the country rejected. He was even mucked about, and they made him think that he could have his passport, him and his wife. He went to the office, they saw the passports in front of them, they told them to come back the next day, and when they did, they turned him down. Stalin told him that they would have a conversation, and Bulgakov held out hope for the rest of his life that that would come to fruition that they indeed would talk to one another, but it never did transpire. And despite being ignored his entire life, the day after he died, and he wrote The Master and Margarita pretty much right up until the point that he died, he was dictating it to his wife, the day after his death, Stalin called Elena and asked if Comrade Bulgakov had died, and when she said yes, he hung up. The thing is, there was this idea with the intelligentsia, with, with many artists, that regardless of how out of control the petty, enabled bureaucracy would get, many intellectuals thought that if they could just speak to Stalin himself, man to man, then maybe they could reason with him. The thing is, the way the Soviet Union was being run, these weren't bugs, these were features. Stalin knew what he was doing, and he also knew how to manipulate the intelligentsia to keep them in line, and that's exactly what he was doing when he called Bulgakov. He was also concerned that word was getting around abroad that all of the artists were dying, and so it was a grand gesture. It was a way of saying to the world, hey, look, I can be kind, and I'm also artistically informed. Indeed, Stalin saw himself as the arbiter of artistic taste and refinement. It's caused a lot of curious questioning as to why Stalin spared Bulgakov. Why didn't he kill Bulgakov? But I think we can understand it when we consider that he was doing a little bit of damage control for his reputation. But on the topic of bumping off writers and artists, Stalin actually said to a confidant that you couldn't just keep doing that. You can't just replenish the stock, the artistic stock, that readily. And so he preferred to control art rather than kill it off completely. And of course, if you are a tyrant, you do want to control art. You want to control literature. And if you look at Soviet art, you will see that Stalin and Lenin are depicted like gods. They're like religious figureheads. And this is very much by design. This is why the state made great efforts to stamp out the prevalence of religious belief in society. They were the figureheads in the atheistic Soviet Union. Communism was the religion. That's what you pledged yourself to. And literature, under this stifling, oppressive regime, had to serve that purpose. But also on the question of why didn't Stalin just kill Bulgakov? Well, firstly, he he genuinely liked his work, he loved his play, and Bulgakov wouldn't have been that much of a threat. He didn't overtly insult Stalin, and so if he didn't do that, that helped. And he rejected the revolution, yes, but he wasn't a radical. There are some that think that Stalin also respected Bulgakov for being a man who stood by his convictions. Despite all of this, however, for the rest of his life, Bulgakov would constantly get his works banned and censored, and he would continue to be considered a dangerous writer. Now, I said that Bulgakov was seeing visions of the devil. These just got worse and worse over the course of his life. He was going through his own personal hell, and the more he encountered the devil, the more his non-belief 
disintegrated and Bulgakov came to the conclusion that if you believe in the devil, you must believe in God. And if you encounter evil, you must believe in good and of course vice versa. And we get this idea in The Master and Margarita that good and evil have a codependent relationship. Here is Bulgakov's charming affable devil, Voland, because indeed he gives us a devil who is charming and affable and although we know that mercy and forgiveness and love, none of this is in the devil's domain, we get a sense that the devil ultimately isn't averse to this. And the devil is a key player when it comes to good, because you can't have good without evil. Speaking to Matthew Levi, one of the apostles, Voland says, kindly consider the question, what would your good do if evil did not exist? And what would the earth look like if shadows disappeared from it? Shadows are cast by objects and people. Do you want to skin the whole earth, tearing all the trees and living things off it because of your fantasy of enjoying bare light? The idea that Bulgakov explores in this book is that there is no light without dark. There is no Jesus Christ without Pontius Pilate and Judas Iscariot. And that is why Bulgakov chooses to open his masterpiece with a quote from Goethe's Mephistopheles from Faust. When Faust asks Mephistopheles who he is, he replies, I am part of that power which eternally wills evil and eternally works good. Now, as part of your reading of this masterpiece, I highly recommend that you familiarize yourself with the story of Faust, because it will make the themes and the characters and indeed the set pieces all the more resonant. And of course, this is gonna increase the difficulty of the book. So you not only need to know about the history of the Soviet Union in order to appreciate the political satire and allegory, but you also need to know Bulgakov's allusions to Goethe and the Bible as well. And for Goethe's Faust, we have a deep dive lecture at the Hardcore Literature Book Club that takes you through parts one and two. Now you only need to read part one in order to appreciate The Master and Margarita and part one is a swift read. You can read it in an evening but it is endlessly relevant. Part two of Goethe's Faust is more of a lifetime reading project. It's difficult and very much like Shakespeare's Hamlet I think we should read Goethe's part two endlessly over the course of our life. So give Faust part one a read and check out our lecture on it where we break down the story Story, the history of it, where it comes from, and how it remains relevant to us today. But simply put, at the opening of Goethe's Faust, we see that Faust has mastered all the realms of human endeavor. He feels as though he has mastered medicine, he has mastered the sciences, he has mastered the humanities. What else is left? And so we see that Faust makes a deal with the devil, a Faustian bargain. Reading Faust will not only increase your appreciation of the character Voland, but it will also increase your appreciation of Bulgakov's character Margarita. And if you want evidence of how powerfully Bulgakov loved Elena, then look no further than his depiction of her in this character, an absolutely beautiful character. And Bulgakov named her after the character in Faust, Margaret or Gretchen, the woman who comes undone thanks to Faust. And yet Margarita in Bulgakov's novel is more the Faustian figure. She's the one that makes the deal with the devil. Anyways, we meet the devil pretty much from the get-go in The Master and Margarita. He manifests in the character of Professor Voland. And we can see that Professor Voland was very much a huge catalyst for the literary storm that was created upon publication. We can see that Bulgakov's devil was thoroughly inspirational to many artists. The one inspiration you will most likely immediately be familiar with is with the Rolling Stones song, Sympathy for the Devil. This is the opening track to the band's 1968 Beggar's Banquet. Mick Jagger read The Master and Margarita and found himself inspired to pen those iconic lyrics. Please allow me to introduce myself. I was round when Jesus Christ had his moment of doubt and pain, made damn sure that Pilate 
washed his hands and sealed his fate. So at the beginning we see that Bulgakov's devil turns up in atheistic Moscow. It is a sticky hot day in the city and the poet homeless and the editor Berlioz are at Patriarch Ponds and they're talking about Homeless's recent anti-religious poem. Berlioz isn't happy with it because whilst it's great that Homeless depicted Jesus Christ in such dark and critical tones, he didn't stress the fact that Jesus didn't exist. The fact that he was framing Christ negatively contains the implicit assumption that he existed and, as Berlioz says, he most certainly did not. Now they start getting into this and Professor Voland, the devil, overhears them and he basically says, I couldn't help but hear it, but did you say that Jesus Christ didn't exist? He tells them that he very much did exist and, in fact, he was there when Pontius Pilate ordered his execution. And in addition to this, Voland even predicts Berlioz's death, death by decapitation. And this isn't a spoiler, this happens very early on. And we see, as the book proceeds, that Professor Voland has a rather fantastical retinue with him. We have a talking cat who walks on two legs and guzzles vodka and plays chess, not particularly well, but he's a chess playing cat and he is called Berlioz. We also have Korovyev, ex-choir master of the angelic choir. He is Volan's assistant and translator and he is capable of creating illusions. We also have Azazello, a fanged assassin and his name refers to the fallen angel Azazel. We have Hela, a beautiful red-headed vampiric naked succubus. And this crew is quite a crew to hang out with. They cause mischief. They use the frenzied and repressive atmosphere of Soviet Russia to run amok and play pranks. And Satan is also looking to put on his annual spring ball. Now the interesting thing about this retinue is it feels like you're falling in with a band of old friends. Now there are three narrative strands in The Master and Margarita. You have the narrative with the poet Homeless or Ivan in Moscow of the 1930s. Then there is a narrative thread that takes us back to Jerusalem or Yerushalayim and takes us to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And in this book we have Yeshua Hanotri, that's Jesus of Nazareth. And then there is a narrative thread that concerns the master, a surrogate for Bulgakov himself. He is a suffering writer who wants to write something true and authentic. And his love, Margarita, desperately wants his book to live despite the oppressive climate that chokes art of life. Now I'm not going to say too much more about these threads because I want to stay away from plot spoilers. But suffice it to say these threads intertwine and are related to each other in a very magical way that works to reinforce some of the themes of fate and predestination and artistic truth that Bulgakov explores. And whilst we're on the subject of spoilers, just a very quick thing for those readers following along with the Hardcore Literature Book Club lecture series. I would like to put out the appeal that when we discuss the book we work hard to be mindful of spoilers and to stay away from spoilers and keep the discussion just to the parts, the sections that are allotted. If we're mindful of spoilers we will be able to keep the secrets and surprises for new readers and it will be really such a joy to see readers piecing the book together and getting that gradual revelation and this will make this a really profound and magical experience for everyone. Now talking about the narrative strands, this introduces another difficulty but also another joy. Now I think the difficulty with The Master and Margarita is front-loaded because at the beginning you're thrust into early 20th century Moscow and then you're taken to Jerusalem, you're yanked back 2,000 years and it might be hard at first to get your grounding but trust me when I say that once you have made it through the first few chapters you will get into it. If you bring yourself to the work you'll absolutely get into the flow, you'll get your grounding and your bearing and very soon you will want to inhale the pages of this book. And I strongly believe that the further into the book you get the more deeply in love with it you will fall. Once you've got your grounding I'm confident that the humour, the pace, the vividness of it all will captivate you. And of course at the Hardcore Literature Book Club our lecture series will help us overcome 
the difficulties in this book and get to the rewards. Now let's talk style and defamiliarization. You will notice as you read this novel that each of the narrative threads has a significantly different style and this is one of the many things that I love about this book. For the section with Voland and his devilish retinue in Moscow we get a magical realist feel and we get absurdist comedy, we get a dark satire, things feel distorted and contorted, colourful and kaleidoscopic. It feels kind of like an opium dream and indeed Bulgakov saw many of his visions of the devil whilst under the influence of morphine. For the sections in Jerusalem with Jesus or Yeshua we get gritty realism. It feels like a historical account and the Bible scenes are ultra realistic. The arrest and meeting with Pontius Pilate, the crucifixion, the scenes with Judas, this is brutally realistic and the realism is all the more startling by virtue of the juxtaposition with the more fantastical passages. Now why does Bulgakov make these scenes, the biblical scenes, so realistic? And not only that, but why does he deviate from the gospel stories? Because if you know the gospels and you know the New Testament you will see that Bulgakov makes some changes. The Bible is the foundational text or collection of texts for the Western tradition. It is the foundation upon which Western literature is built. It is the work or series of works that most other works refer to. After the Bible, foundational works include the complete works of Shakespeare. They include Milton, his Paradise Lost, Dante, his Divine Comedy. But in terms of influence, the Bible is number one for Western literature. So regardless of how well acquainted we are with the Bible, most of us are going to have some familiarity with the story of Jesus Christ. And when we we read these sections in Bulgakov we get a really uncanny sense of recognition because Jesus' sayings are there, kind of, but new ones are added and his sayings are altered, Pilate is there, but we get a sense with these characters that they are real people. There is an extraordinary amount of psychological complexity and with Pontius Pilate we get a real conflicted human being. We get Matthew Levi, he's there, but it's interesting that Jesus or Yeshua is a little bit critical of what he has been noting down and he says much of what he has written has been misinterpreted. It would serve you very well to familiarise yourself with the gospel accounts of Jesus' execution, his betrayal, his meeting with Pontius Pilate because then you can see what Bulgakov has done, what he has done differently. Bulgakov is doing this because he's using a technique known as defamiliarization, a term popularized by the Russian formalists. And defamiliarization is the artistic technique of presenting the familiar in strange and unfamiliar ways in order to refresh the reader's perception. And Bulgakov knows that the Bible stories have been taken for granted. They are so well known that perhaps they no longer signify or communicate their truth. And so by drawing our attention to the differences, he is able to get scripture to re-communicate those enduring truths, the truths at the heart of religion, and in a time and place when religion is being vehemently rejected. Biographer J. A. E. Curtis puts it best when talking about the Jerusalem scenes. He says, where something has become so familiar that it risks becoming a cliche, it loses its power to move us. The creative artist therefore has to find new ways to present the familiar, so as to startle us into refreshing our perceptions. When reading the Yerushalayim chapters, we are constantly disconcerted when minor details clash with our preconceived expectations of the gospel narrative. The overall effect of this is to clear the way for a story in which we are invited to evaluate afresh the character of Pontius Pilate. He is presented as a lonely man whose closest companion is his dog. He suffers from excruciating migraines and is tormented by his failure to protect Yeshua. So we have magical realism, we have gritty defamiliarization, and then when it comes to the scenes with the master and Margarita, we have romanticism. We have a personal intimate memoir, a memoir of Bulgakov's soul, and we also have some of the most beautiful prose that I have read in translation, prose that makes me yearn to learn Russian so that I can read the original. 
which leads us quite nicely, as we wrap up today, into talking about the practicalities of reading the Master and Margarita. And let's begin by talking about translation. Which translation of Bulgakov's masterpiece should you read? At time of recording, there are nine English translations, and you'll see that the most popular and readily available translations are the Burgin and O'Connor, the Pavir and Volokonsky, the Glennie, and the Ginsberg. Now, if you want the decision to be made for you, then I personally highly recommend the Pavir and Volokonsky, which is available in Penguin paperback. It's also available in the Folio Society edition. I will be referring to this translation and edition for the Hardcore Literature Book Club lecture series. Pavir and Volokonsky are a husband and wife translator team, and they first shot to fame when their translation of Tolstoy's Anna Karenina was featured on Oprah's book club. I absolutely adore their Anna Karenina. I also think their translation of Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov is excellent, and we have lecture series for both of those masterpieces at the book club. They're not my go-to, however, when it comes to war and peace, but one can't argue with their aesthetic decisions. When you read their renditions of different writers, you'll notice that every single writer is markedly different, unlike, for example, Constance Garnett. Great translator, and she was a bridge from Russia to the West, but all of her translations, regardless of who she's translating, sound the same. But when Pivir and Volokonsky translate a writer, Tolstoy sounds like Tolstoy, Dostoevsky sounds distinctive, Bulgakov sounds different from Chekhov. They aim aim to get as close to the authentic original voice as possible, and they want to get the experience of reading the Russian. Those who read Russian tell me that they do a very good job, but I have also heard from people who say that they can be overly literal. And so when you read their book, this can give the story, the syntax, a kind of stilted or foreign feel. Personally, I love their rendition of Bulgakov, but you'll typically see that readers prefer either the Pavir and Volokonsky or the Burgin and O'Connor translation. That gets a lot of love. That comes neck and neck with the P&V. The Burgin and O'Connor is excellent, and this was the first translation to include explanatory notes, and this one was based on the uncensored version of the book, and it's very faithful to Bulgakov's syntax, and is also designed to be a literal translation, though many say that this one is quite easy to read. Now, I emphasise the fact that the PNV and the Burgin and O'Connor use the uncensored version because other translations don't. For example, the Mirror Ginsberg is very good, it's very readable, and so is the Michael Glennie. They both do a tremendous job, but both of these translations came out around the same time time that the censored version was being published, and they used that as their source. So these versions have things missing. For that reason, I probably wouldn't recommend the Ginsberg or the Glennie, tremendous though they are, if you want the full reading experience. When it comes to reading in translation, I recommend simply going to the very beginning of the book, checking out different translations, and read the opening paragraph and just see which one gels with you the best. Choosing the right translation is often a very personal choice, and it makes all the difference when it comes to your reading experience. Sometimes you'll read a book in translation, and you'll dismiss the book when what you're actually dismissing is the translation. And if you're following along with the book club lecture series, yes, I'll be referring to the P and V, but I encourage you to pick the translation that speaks to you. Do a little taste test of the beginning, and it'll be very interesting to compare and contrast the nuances of translation as we work our way through the book. Now, let's continue to talk about practicalities of deep reading. I think it's good to measure out the pace at which you can comfortably read for maximum reward. You want to read consistently. Consistency is key when it comes to deep reading the great books. And consistently for me means reading every day or most days of the week. And I think it's a great idea to predefine a daily page quota that is conducive to steady, slow reading. You don't want to give yourself too many pages that are hard to hit most days. You want a page number that you'll be able to hit reasonably comfortably. You want a little bit of a stretch, but you want to be able to hit those pages even on busy days. Of course, some days you might read more than others. Weekends you might read quite a bit more, and then during the week you might just read a few pages here and there. But you want to go at a pace that allows you to pause liberally. 
when you come to resonant lines. You want to be able to reread as you go. So if something strikes you, you can go back to it, linger over it, reread it several times. You also want to be able to make marginalia, notes in the margin. You want to look things up as well. When you find anything confusing or you don't know what a reference is, you want to have that time baked into your reading quota to go search allusions up and expand your reading and fall down literary rabbit holes. You may even want to really slow things down by pairing your reading with listening. Listening to an audiobook simultaneously whilst you run your eyes across the page is a really great practice if you really want to absorb the book and possess it and make it your own because it feels like you're watching a film. Most of us can read quicker than we can listen, so listening simultaneously slows us down and whilst we're slowing down, insights arise. Now at the Hardcore Literature Book Club, we will be taking this masterpiece across six to seven weeks. The book is roughly 400 pages long, which makes it a little bit shorter than our previous read of John Steinbeck's East of Eden. That was 600 pages. But The Master and Margarita is a bit more challenging and it's quite densely packed and it requires a lot of concentration in places. Quite simply, if you aim to read eight to 10 pages per day, you will very easily get the book read and read deeply in under two months. That's a really nice time frame to read one of the greatest books of the 20th century. Now you can ramp that pace up a little bit, you can take it down a notch, depending on your own personal rhythm, your obligations, your commitment ability. I really do think that the perfect pace is the pace that you can read deeply and comfortably at. Eight pages per day is a pretty nice prescription because you can read four pages in the morning and it's not too difficult to read four pages. That doesn't take that much time. And so if you have a little bit more time, you can slow it right down. You can look everything up. You can read aloud. You can make notes. You can read four pages in the morning and four pages before bed. And you'll find that you journey through the work quite comfortably. Our lectures for The Master and Margarita will come out just like our previous big read on alternating weekends, every other weekend. So you will have a fortnight between lectures to get the assigned reading in. And for the first reading assignment, along with recommended resources for secondary reading, links to different documentaries and films, and orienting questions to help you deepen your reading, for the first reading assignment, please check out the post for this discussion at patreon.com forward slash hardcore literature. So we will have Bulgakov on alternating weekends, and the weekends we're not talking about Bulgakov, we will have more exciting bookish content. For example, this weekend coming, at time of recording, we are going to have a deep lecture on William Shakespeare's The Tragedy of Othello. Now this is part of a sweeping project to read all of Shakespeare in a proposed chronology, The Shakespeare Project. But even if you are not partaking in that literary adventure, I would really love to encourage as many readers as possible to hop on and read at least Othello. Now is the perfect time to read some Shakespeare and you can absolutely read this play and enjoy it in isolation. Now the reason why I want to encourage readers to read this one, and there's a twofold reason. The first reason is because because we are now about to hit a sequence of plays that I call The Tragic Procession. And reading this sequence is one of the most sublime reading and viewing experiences you can ever do. It's Othello, followed by King Lear, and then Macbeth, and then Antony and Cleopatra. And I know that if you read Othello, you will definitely want to check out the next tragedy. Will Shakespeare penned tragic masterpiece after tragic masterpiece back to back during the age of plague. And if you read just a handful of plays this year, then make it these tragedies. Then, weekend after Othello, we'll be back to Bulgakov, and then the weekend after that, we will be diving in to Machiavelli's The Prince. So you may be able to understand why I am encouraging a deep reading of Othello. If you know anything about the villain of Shakespeare's play, Iago, then you'll know that Machiavellian 
is how he is typically described. So these are very complimentary reads. Our appreciation of Machiavelli's The Prince is our first in our Foundational Thinkers deep dive, our special quarterly project, which focuses on some of the most influential texts in the Western tradition. If you make an acquaintance with these works, then your appreciation of the great novels we are reading will be deepened significantly. More information on The Prince and that project, our ethos, our approach, and so forth, will be provided at the book club a little closer to the time. But all this to say, we'll be digging in to some profound works. And later this year, we will also read the plays of Moliere. We'll read Jane Austen. We will journey through the tale of Genji. We will also read Dante and Kafka and Thomas Hardy, to name just a few. And of course, we also have a huge back catalogue of read-throughs and lectures, so you can always add more exciting works into your reading program if you like, and you can explore the great books on demand at your own pace. And I'm going to leave it there for today. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for reading along. I hope very much that you fall deeply in love with Bulgakov as I have. If you are preparing for your first read of The Master and Margarita, then let us know. What are you expecting? What are you looking forward to? What do you know of the book? And what's your experience with Russian literature up until this point? Indeed, if this is a reread for you, then please let us know. What are you looking forward to the most when it comes to rereading this book? What stood out to you and resonated with you the most last time? Thank you again so much, and I hope you have a lovely day. Bye-bye for now, everybody, and happy reading.